everyone. Good this morning. Good to see you. Uh, on the Lord's Day and uh, August. So we're still here, isn't it? Just enjoy what we have. Uh, let's look at the prayer first and then we'll proceed. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the many gifts you give us. Thank you, Father, for the uh, gift of time together, the gift of worship in your presence. And we just ask, Lord, that you would meet with us. That we open our hearts to you and we receive from you and we give to you the glory and the honor of your name. Uh, you are so worthy. Uh, Father, we just pray for uh, you to be with us. We pray for those that aren't here, members are traveling, on vacation, or are gone for different reasons. We ask you to be with them also. Uh, we ask you to keep them. We ask you, Father, for your grace in our lives. We thank you for that we receive. In Jesus' name. Uh, what's happening? Mom time is going to be starting up pretty soon on Thursday evenings. And so for those that are involved in some of our, I think this year is just different. We don't need child care workers because they're not providing child care. So we're taking a year off from that. And there's also not a good element of that. But we want to pray for this. As this is a, all these transitional things happening. And this maybe opens the door for some moms, but also makes it hard for others. So we want to just pray that God will will use this ministry to start in September. We are going to plan an ice cream social game night, and typically we have it right outside in this grassy area, kind of a kickoff to our truth time. So that's scheduled for the 13th. It's a Sunday at 3 o'clock, and I think different ones make a homemade ice cream and bring different things like that, top HR games, make a fun event. So we want to just uh, put that on your calendar, and then the following week we'll begin with truth time, classes to begin at 9.30, as sharp as we can, with coffee and refreshments. We'll have a sign up for that for uh, those who might want to bring some goodies, that type of thing, at 9.15. So that is coming up beginning next month. Of course, our website is available. If you need to use it or miss a week, I encourage you to tune in, um, come back and see what's going on, and then just to offer I want to thank you for your faithfulness. God has been faithful to us, and we just thank you for being faithful to you. So let's pray together at this time for the offering, and just go from there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you again for the gifts you give us. And as we return a portion to you, we ask you, Lord, to use it for your kingdom. Father, with the very uh, needs that our church has and is expecting, we pray, Father, that, that you would just bless what's given and cause it to go a long ways. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Kids Corner. Yes, you do. So today, I brought a collection of my, um, some stuffed animals. So our kids, when they were growing up, we got them stuffed animals, or maybe someone else got them, I don't remember. But anyway, um, I brought some of them. I brought 10 of my favorite stuffed animals. Now, these were, we got dogs for each one of the boys. We got three boys. So there was that dog. There was this dog. And there's this one. And this one was kind of special because when I was growing up, my grandma and grandma, hi, what's the best? Good to see you. I was telling everybody, I just got, I brought some stuffed animals to show you guys today. And I hope you guys, do you guys know how to count? Like you could help me count, right? So, um, you know what? Should I put these next to here? Okay. So, those were the three for the boys. And then, look at, there's another cute little puppy too. So that's four. And then there's this one that kind of looks like that one. Five. And then look at this one. Isn't that a cute? It looks a lion, isn't it? Okay, so that's six. And what's this one? A lion. It's a bear. Yeah. Or just kind of like a dog, too. Well, I'm not sure. And then what's this one? Another dog, there, and another little dog. Okay, so let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many did I say I brought? No, I said I brought ten. Where do you think the other one is? Could you help me look around for it? Because I know I brought it here to church. Could you help me look around for it? Where do you think it might be? 
to cut that barrier and get as far away from that slavery system or that bondage element as possible. Churches in Galatia that Paul is writing to had heard the gospel. They had been slaves. We read in, in a little bit further into the fourth chapter, uh, it tells us that, that they, were, they were bound to slaves as slaves to gods that they couldn't see, gods that didn't even exist. So this is just part of their history, and now they were set free when the gospel came, when Paul and had brought the gospel to them. The gospel, we understand that by faith in Christ alone, we can have a great relationship with God. The pagan religions, all of the pagan religions, to my understanding, all of them demanded things of the people. It might demand sacrifices. Some of them demanded child sacrifices. Things that maybe the people didn't even want to do. All with the hope of maybe appeasing a God out there that they thought was there or maybe hope was there, but with no promises. Perhaps I will give enough sacrifice enough, and then this God will look favorably upon me, or at least not look negatively upon me. So there was this bondage to this element. And Paul came to the Gentiles, and he gave them the gospel to set them free. But then people came in, people from the Jewish faith that had really been set free themselves, and they came back in after Paul left, and they were, they were came in with this message, and no, you, you think aren't free like that. If you're going to become a Christian, a Jew, like us as Jewish Christians, then you're going to have to, you know, keep the law. You're going to have to go back under this, an, an element that was different from what their element was, but similar in a way in that you're going to have to obey these types of things, including submit yourselves to circumcision. So this was what was happening, and, and Paul, when he wrote the Revelations, was very frustrated with this. When Paul wrote to the Gentiles, he used Abraham as an example. In the third chapter of, of Galatians, we can find the, the name Abraham 11 times. And in the fourth chapter, there are 11 verses, if I'm counting right, where Abraham and his family and his two sons, the son of promise and the son of bondage, those two sons, there's 11 verses that are dedicated to that. And this looks somewhat strange from the outside if you really think about it. Because Paul is writing to the Galatians. Abraham was a Jew. He was the founder of the Jews. He had lived 1,800 years above that prior to this time. Abraham had... There was no connection in history to the Galatians. It wasn't in their family tree. It wasn't in their history books. And yet Paul is using Abraham as an example to the Gentile Galatians for what faith really looks like. In Genesis, God had this, made this special covenant with Abraham. He told him that, that from you, that you will become the father of many nations. There will be a great nation come from you with more descendants in the sky than the stars you can count in the sky. You can count them. So there was this promise, that, and, and the promise extended that, that Abraham and this generation, this family line that would start, that they would bless all nations. That's where Judaism began. Abraham was the first Gentile convert. That's where the Jews began, right there. And the, the Jews recognized this. They honored this. During Paul's days when he's writing, not all Jews honored Jesus, but all of them recognized Abraham. Abraham was our father. And he was firmly implanted in their name, in, in their religion, in their faith, in their heritage. Jesus in book of chapter excuse me, the book of John, chapter 8, Jesus is speaking with, with Jews, and it says in verse 31, he says, As Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
But we are descendants of Abraham, he said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean? You will be set free. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. Yes, I realize that you're descendants of Abraham, and yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no, no room in your hearts for my message. I am telling you what I saw when I was, when I was with the father, but you were following the advice of your father. Our father is Abraham, they declared. No, Jesus replied, for if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you are trying to kill me because I told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No, you were imitating your real father. They replied, we are illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. And Jesus told him, if God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things that he does. Wow. Wow. That's kind of offensive if you're a Jew. You know, that, that would be like someone maybe coming in here and saying, you know, hey, all you folks... You know, your father's the devil. You're not real. Your faith's not genuine. So what Jesus, the Jews said, were descendants of Abraham. They relied on it. They depended upon it. And they said, Abraham is our father. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 you've got it wrong. Your actions have betrayed you. Your actions have revealed really who your father is. Your father is the devil himself. So this bloodline, even though Jesus recognized it, he didn't deny that they were lineal descendants of Abraham. He basically said, that doesn't mean a thing. Yes, you're from God's chosen people, but that isn't enough. Your father, spiritual father, is the devil himself, and that's no different for us than us until we come to faith in Christ. The Jews came to yeah, the Jews came to Galatia after Paul did. And Paul was forced, and they were forcing the Gentiles to believe that they must become like them. And they were using Abraham as an example. And it was in Abraham himself who was the first person, the first word, one for whom circumcision came. So God brought this, this this uh, sign of circumcision, which was a sign of the covenant that God was making with him that he would make of them great nations. He brought that to Abraham. The Jews had taken this and put it in as a condition for salvation. Chapter 15 of Genesis. God made the promise to Abraham. The promise of this great family. And it tells us in verse 6, it says, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And many years later, we read in chapter 17, where God once again restated this promise to Abraham. And then he said, This circumcision, I want this to begin now as a sign of my covenant. It's, it's going to be a sign that you are a called out a special people. It was at that time where Abraham, with his son, who was Ishmael, who had just been born, but before Isaac was born, where circumcision came in to faith. The Judaizers, honestly, they didn't know their own history. They didn't know the history. They had it wrong. For Abraham was justified by faith and not by anything else. Galatians chapter 3. And we're still on chapter 3. Okay, maybe chapter 4 next week. 
in Galatians, I read, Paul writes, I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It's because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. So here, Paul is rehearsing or restating what's written in Genesis as to how Abraham, the first Jew, became right with God. It was because of his faith. And he goes on to say that the real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. Read on. What's more? The scriptures look forward to this time when God would make the Gentiles right in his sight because of their faith. God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ will share the same blessing Abraham received because of his good, because of his faith. So the good news, and we, we know what the word good news is, or what the word that's translated as good news is, the gospel, the gospel was shared with Abraham. All nations will be blessed. And then all who put their faith in Christ will receive the same blessing that Abraham received. This is more than a promise. Okay? Sometimes we look at the Bible and we read certain verses and say, well, that's a promise. And often with the promise, it is tied to something in the future. This is present tense. All who put their faith in Christ share the same blessings that Abraham received through his faith now. Now. And Abraham's faith was demonstrated in many ways. Throughout his life, he, he, he lived faith. When he had this opportunity, when God had taken him to the promised land and he brought his nephew along, who was Lot, and, and they came to this land that God had promised and there was some division in the family, he gave Lot first choice. And Lot chose, we know, the land towards Sodom, and, and we know what that story is. And then it's like, as Abraham, he's standing on top of the mountain, and God speaks to him, he says, everything you see is yours. I'm going to fulfill my promise in a very literal sense. And God blessed him immensely. Some have come to take this thought of, of the blessings of Abraham to mean that God is going to bless me in this life now with riches and abundance, great family, numbers, money, wealth, whatever it is, health. And so this is actually a verse that's used quite often for those that live in this prosperity teaching movement that we can say that we are promised the blessings of Abraham. And look how God blessed him. He was a wealthy man in every way. And yet if we look forward just a few more verses, in verse 14, we see that Paul writes, Through Christ God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham, so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Can you see this? That the Promise, the blessings of Abraham, the blessing that was given to Abraham that, that we are to receive is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a difference, a difference maker. He's the one that delivers us from the bondage of the law to where we can live by the Spirit and be set free from the law so we no longer have to live by the dictates of the law with the punishments that come with it. So we are not under the law. We don't have to live with this attitude of, I have to, but rather because of the Holy Spirit, God comes into our hearts, and we either get to or we want to serve Him. In First Corinthians, the Corinthians must have been a little bit slow to catch on, maybe I can say it that way, because three times this thought is brought out to the, in the letters to Corinthians. Paul writes here, first of all, he says, Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the Spirit of God lives in you? So why don't just take us as a collective church, as a collective relatively small group, that we together are the temple of God. It is not 
this building. But together, we are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God lives in us. We should be thankful. We should rejoice. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul writes, Don't you realize that your body, now here is more of an individual sense, this is in the context of sexual purity, that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in us and was given to us, that we're not our own, we're bought with a price, and therefore we should glorify God with everything that we have in our body and through our body. Why? Because we're his temple. That's the blessing of Abraham, that God has chosen to live in us. In the 6th chapter, verse 15 of 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, We are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is present tense. This isn't for out there when we die or a reward that we'll receive later, but the blessings of Abraham is to be received in this lifetime, and it comes to us when we put faith in Christ for salvation. When we come to Him. The blessings of Abraham. We don't do life alone. I'm not just speaking in the context of, of one another, which is so important. But we have the presence of the Holy Spirit with us and through us to help us, to guide us, to give us direction, and all of that. The law was given to identify sin, and that's what his purpose was. The law was given after Abraham received this promise and after he was declared righteous by faith. We come to faith in Christ. Faith in Christ makes us righteous with God. But it's the Holy Spirit who helps us to live that way. We can't do it on our own. We struggle in whatever area of life, whatever area of temptation that we have, whatever area of I just can't kick this or I can't get rid of it or I can't get past it. We struggle in these areas. We come to, come to faith in Christ for salvation, eternal life with Him. But the Holy Spirit helps us to live a life that's pleasing to Him. Again, in chapter 5 of Galatians, Paul says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let this happen. Don't fight it. Don't resist it. Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. And then you will be doing what your sinful nature craves. And all of us have a sinful nature that craves certain things. And pulls us that direction. And when we fall and we, we find ourselves in the muck and the mud, and we get back up and we're like, God, I didn't want to go there. Paul says, let the Spirit guide your life. Live in the Spirit. Don't live under this law and the condemnation that comes with it. That, oh, I've just got to do this to please God, but whether God is lives in me, and I recognize this, and I submit to this, is that He is the King of my life. And the promise that I have, that the Holy Spirit is with me, so I don't have to make those choices. Paul, I really believe, was telling the Galatians, don't forget what you already know. Don't forget this. I told you once. You understood it. Don't forget it. Don't forget what you've experienced. Don't forget the freedom that I gave you, or what the Lord gave you, when you left the bondage of the Gentile pagan religion with all the demands of that sacrifice, sacrificial system. When you left that and you came to Christ and you found this acceptance and freedom and forgiveness, all because of what Jesus has done for you. Don't forget. Don't forget that you have the promise of Abraham, the Holy Spirit, who will help you through all of life, who will give you the strength you need to resist temptation. That's always designed to drag you back into bondage. I think at times we lower you know, put at a lower value the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we really don't give Him the glory and the honor and the praise that's due to Him also as part of the Godhead. That the Holy Spirit is so critical. In the book of John, in the book of St. John, we see different times here where, where Jesus wants us to understand 
wants us to understand the value of what he's given to us. In the 14th chapter, I'll start with verse 15. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He's the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. Here we see this word advocate, but if you go through different translations, we'll see how it's translated as helper, encourager, comforter, counselor. The, the Greek word is paraclete, and that word means that one who comes alongside. You know, we like to do certain things together. I, I know that Nancy from time to time she'll go on a walk with somebody, or we go bike riding together. It's different than doing it alone. We have the Holy Spirit who comes alongside us throughout all of life, into the difficulties of life, into the hard situations, into the pain of life, that we have God's Holy Spirit. And that's the blessing of Abraham that's promised to us. In chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus continues, he says, but when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and He will remind you of everything I've told you. So the Holy Spirit's our teacher. The one who basically helps us to understand. You ever feel like sometimes, like, I just can't get it? You know, maybe you can relate to the days of, of taking algebra in school, and the teacher's up there doing something on the bulletin board, and you're looking at it going, I just don't get it. You know? The Holy Spirit is our teacher to help us to put the pieces together in our mind. So we can get it. So we can understand what God is doing and how God is working all things together for the good of us. No matter what the situation looks like, that we can understand what God is doing and that He has a purpose. That's great. And that's for our benefit. In the 16th chapter... John, verse 13. Jesus said, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Now, that's one of the, the difficulties of living in, in this day and age. Right now, we all struggle with it. Is what is truth? We read so many reports, and we read different things, this and that, and we get con confused, like, what is actually true? When it comes to the things that really, really matter, the Holy Spirit is our guide to teach us truth, to filter it out, and to be able to say, no, that is not true. Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, he was writing for them to help them understand that they were sold a bill of goods by that group of people who came as Jews to say that this is a, these are the additional things that you have to do in addition to your faith. I thank God that we don't have that. For if we have a list of things to do to please God, to earn His favor, then we will always live with the thought, this haunting thought, have I done enough? Or will this screw up, this mess up, mess it all up? We're all sinners. Saved by grace, through faith in Christ. Paul and writing to the Ephesians, he wrote out a prayer. And if you ever have done this, sometimes this is just a good exercise. You know when you're praying, maybe you write your prayer out to the Lord. Write it on paper. Not to share with anybody, but just for you. You know, write your prayer out to the Lord. What God is, is saying to you, or, or well, how are you pouring out your heart to the Lord? Paul, he wrote this prayer in, in verse six, chapter 3, verse 16. He said, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit. Do we feel like at times we just can't win? Like we just, there's a battle in life. The Holy Spirit is here to give us power through his spirit in the inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And when Christ is dwelling and living in our hearts and at the and then it has the crown or the, in the throne of our heart. Life is different. It comes back so much to our letting the Holy Spirit rule in our lives. 
The same blessing as given to us is given to Abraham. And this blessing comes through the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit that empowers us, guides us, directs us, leads us. Yes, he convicts us. He draws us back to himself. He gives us hope. He gives us light. He reaffirms our salvation, confirms for us that yes, your relationship with God is good. Now this is how to live it, and I'm going to give you the powers. So Paul writes, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I, I'm so thankful for our, our leadership team that's in this search process because when I'm with the leadership team and when I'm around them and we're on the subject of, of this change that's coming, I sense a dependence upon God. That gives great hope. Great hope. Instead, we'll figure this out on ourselves. We can do it. There's nothing like the we can do it attitude that's really setting ourselves up for a fall of some kind so that we know that we have to be dependent upon God. Let the Spirit of God guide you. What's going on in your life? Is there some issue that's a little bit confusing, a little bit hazy, a little bit difficult? Maybe whatever area, the answer is let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. He will guide you towards Jesus and He will give you strength, wisdom, understanding, guidance, direction, and power. The power to live the way that you really desire to live to honor the one who saved you. Let's close. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit that's given to us. Lord, forgive us for the times when we ignore your spirit that's, that's living within us and we, we just kind of like have the vine down so that we don't hear you through the spirit. Dear God, I just pray that you will help us to be attuned to the spirit. Help us, Lord, to find the power to live lives that are with you in every area of our life. Regardless of where our weakness is, that we would look to you in that area and we find the power and the strength through the Spirit of God that lives in us. Thank you, dear God. Now, Lord, as we come to a time of prayer and praise, we just ask you, Lord, to help us to open our hearts in appreciation for what you've done for us. To worship you from deep within, for you are worthy of our praise. I pray this in his name. Musicians, please come.
I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Isaiah 12, 2. service has been a real blessing to you. And you know, if there's ever anything we can do to help you get to know this God that we love so much, or if we can encourage you in your life today, we would love to do that. Just reach out to us through our Facebook page, where you can send us a message, or go to our website, 
where you can find all our contact information as well as additional things you might want to know about us. Those links will be up in just a minute. And meanwhile, God bless you.